Greetings, I'm Ruben Martinez. And welcome to Future You. Future You hosts presenters, scholars, uh, activists who are addressing issues regarding the influence and the impact of neoliberalism on higher education, particularly public higher education. We're very pleased today to have with us Ellen Schrecker, who is Professor Emerita at Yeshiva uh, University. And also with her is Jennifer Ruth, who will serve as discussant. She is over at Portland State University. Ellen is regarded as one of the foremost scholars on McCarthyism, and she also has uh, done a great deal of work on, on higher education, particularly academic freedom, as has Jennifer as well. Uh, what we have today is a presentation uh, titled, Will the University Survive? Austerity, Political Repression, and the Attack on Academic Freedom. This follows on the work that uh, Ellen has done in the past. Uh, she had a book titled The Lost Soul of Higher Education, Corporatization, the Assault on Academic Freedom, and the End of the American University. That is a pretty strong title there, Ellen. <laughs> Also, the lost promise, American universities in the 1960s. So having said that, we are delighted to have Ellen with us today. Uh, Ellen, would you please uh, take over? What I do want to talk about now is the fact that we are confronting the most serious crisis that has ever occurred uh, within the world of American higher education. Now, as uh, Ruben pointed out, I've done a lot of work on McCarthyism and on um, political repression and higher education. And I do think uh, that what is happening today is worse, much worse than McCarthyism. McCarthyism only ta targeted individual professors uh, about their past associations with a uh, communist party, mainly in the 1930s and 40s. It never uh, questioned their teaching or their research. Today's repression is much worse because it's invading classrooms. It's preventing college professors from teaching about so-called divisive issues. It's banning whole subjects like gender studies and ethnic studies and forcing professors uh, to begin to uh, indulge in what we call both sidesism, uh, teaching a kind of fake form of, say, history that uh, discusses the quote unquote advantages of slavery as well as its disadvantages or uh, presents both sides of the Holocaust, which is needless to say, absurd. Um, how that had happened, how what had been a flourishing, highly respected system of higher education is now fighting for its survival, for its integrity and ability to function as the main source of independent knowledge within our endangered democratic polity uh, is what I want to address. I'll be telling a complicated story. It's one that began nearly 60 years ago when the university got caught in the middle of a collision between a push for greater democratization within American society and a backlash against that particular movement, uh, a backlash that was funded by wealthy reactionaries and promoted by neoliberal ideologues that clothed their inegalitarian agenda by attacking the evils, whatever they were, of higher education. Meanwhile, all of this is occurring at a time of uh, significant economic dislocation and growing inequality that undermined the ability of universities to provide what was on the verge of becoming real, the mass a, a system of mass, affordable, high quality public higher education that would create or help people become competent citizens of a genuinely uh, flourishing democratic system. So let's begin 
First, I think, by recognizing that what we're seeing today with regard to universities is part of a much broader partisan campaign by an increasingly authoritarian uh, section of the Republican Party that despite the unpopularity of much of its program is determined to remain in power by illegitimate means. We're seeing lies, we're seeing gerrymandered legislatures, voting restrictions, and new laws against um, vulnerable uh, members of the LGBTQ community, as well as laws against teaching the truth about in our classrooms about our nation's less than um, idealized past. Now, it's important to realize that education in the United States and elsewhere has always been suspect to those devoted to maintaining hierarchical systems of inequality within their societies, especially with regard to class, to race, to sexuality, and uh, gender. Before the Civil War in the South, slaves were denied the right to read. Um, in the early 20th century, several states had laws against the teaching of uh, evolution as epitomized in the very notorious Scopes trial in Tennessee in the 1920s. And there was a general crackdown on a number of fairly eminent social scientists at the turn of the 20th, the end of the 19th, early 20th century, among the first generation of modern academics who were threatening uh, the new industrial uh, capitalists uh, by looking at how those uh, people who had uh, often funded or and founded the universities at which they taught and were uh, these uh, academics were questioning what um, these rather rich donors uh, were doing with regard to the treatment of their uh, workers. McCarthyism, like today's partisan uh, attack on the universities, was essentially uh, an equally partisan attempt to roll back New Deal reforms, um, similar to today's attack on the universities. Uh, in the McCarthy period, from the late 40s through to uh, the late 50s, really, uh, probably at least 100 faculty members were fired. There were uh, anti-communist investigations, loyalty oaths, um, and an atmosphere, a chill, as it were, that uh, produced considerable self-censorship and that eliminated most left-wing thought and political activity on the nation's campuses until the late 1950s um, when the civil rights movement occurred and forced the nation to pay attention to the real life problems of racial discrimination instead of the uh, non-existent hyped threat of uh, communist subversion. Meanwhile, uh, and this is what makes the story rather complicated, the universities were experiencing what many scholars consider their golden age. This was a period of massive expansion of higher education that began with the GI Bill after World War II and increased uh, as universities and colleges anticipated the arrival of a tsunami of baby boomers on their own campuses. Um, the powers that be, as a result, responded to what they considered a major crisis by throwing money at my generation of future academics. I mean, literally, I didn't even have to apply to graduate school. Uh, to get funded. Um, doesn't happen anymore, of course. But this was a period when universities and colleges were highly respected and becoming more democratic 
as they began to move toward the system of affordable, high quality mass public higher education, especially in states like California and New York. Never before and never again was American higher education to enjoy so much authority and respect, especially, we should point out, after the Soviets launched their Sputnik Sputnik satellite in 1957, and there was a kind of panic uh, that uh, ensued, uh, turning the notion that we were somehow behind the Soviets in space and making higher education, especially in the uh, in the sciences, a matter of national security during the early Cold War. It was also, and this is important, seen as the main engine of individual social mobility within American society, and as the institution that would provide solutions to the nation's most uh, difficult social problems, including and especially racial inequality. Um, We now know that that was not the case. Um, The universities did could not have performed such a function. But at the time, we didn't realize how unrealistic that was or uh, understand, I think, that the Academy's golden age was on the verge of ending. That change came quickly. First with the student movement of the mid-60s and after And then with the end of the automatic expansion of the American economy after the oil shocks of 1973 and the uh, inflation of the same time. Now, this uh, transformation in the status and reputation of the university uh, happens very suddenly. We could actually give it a date and place. Uh, how about Berkeley in the uh, on October 1st, 1964, when several thousand students surrounded a police car uh, holding an arrested um, civil rights organizer uh, for trying to recruit students for off-campus political work. Uh, What was important about this was it was the first time students engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience directed against their institutions uh, and demanding the same kind of political and civil rights that uh, ordinary citizens had off campus. They were just seeking free speech, as they said. Uh, the situation escalated a bit and spread throughout the universities when uh, Lyndon Johnson escalated the war in the spring of 1965. And the anti-war movement was um, really uh, jump-started on American campuses with the teach-in movement and demonstrations against the draft. Uh, there was a lot of media attention. They were focusing on what seemed to be the kind of uh, political violence, if you will, against property mainly on a few campuses and uh, creating an image uh, that began to turn the public against universities uh, during a period of considerable civil unrest in the rest of society. Uh, conservative politicians and uh, right-wing pundits began attacking universities. And they did so by creating a scenario that consisted of a um, institution that housed out of control, irrational students, um, future Hitler youth was was something they were called, while um, Professors uh, were seen as radicals egging on these students and weak need administration administers, weak need 
administrators were caving into their every whim. Um, this was totally unrealistic portrayal uh, of what was happening, but it was a scenario that slightly altered to fit uh, current uh, circumstances remains potent to this day. It was an easy way for ambitious politicians to exploit the unrest of the period, and many uh, took advantage of it uh, very quickly, including, and most uh, importantly, a former movie star who uh, made his career uh, ran, running for governor of California by attacking the Berkeley free speech movement. He promised that he would crack down on uh, the terrible scene at, on the campus uh, with, in his words, at the point of a bat bayonet if needed. And he uh, fulfilled his promises. One of his first acts as governor, Reagan fired the president of the University of California, and then collaborated with the uh, California state legislature in refusing to grant faculty in the uh, main institutions of higher learning uh, the automatic cost of living increase that went to every other state employee. Uh, other in other states, other politicians jumped on this bandwagon, especially with regard to uh, invoking financial sanctions uh, against the universities, uh, depriving rioting students, supposedly, of their fellowships, but in particular, cutting back on the uh, support, the budgetary support that state legislatures up until now, that point had been uh, proud of giving to their uh, state colleges and universities. Meanwhile, all this was happening at a time of enormous structural economic change. By the mid-1970s, the nation was experienced uh, an oil crisis and serious inflation, and the end of the post-World War II economic expansion. Uh, it was, ex in particular, it was experiencing what we now call deindustrialization, the end of um, the provision of blue-collaring man blue-collar manufacturing jobs that could support. Uh, a middle-class lifestyle for uh, people, usually white males, without uh, bachelor degrees. As a result, uh, higher education began to emerge as the main source of upward economic mobility, even as the public was less supportive of funding that uh, sort of engine of social mobility. Uh, maybe because uh, so many of its new students uh, were no longer middle-class white men. These cutbacks were particularly serious at second-tier state schools that educated about 80% of American undergraduate students. Uh, and led to a regime of austerity on many campuses that was to undermine the quality of the education that was being offered at those institutions. This is important. These cutbacks really worsened higher education, most deteriorously by the gradual replacement, and it was gradual in the beginning, the gradual replacement of full-time tenured and tenure-track faculty with people uh, who had contingent appointments, poorly paid instructors 
who were teaching with part-time and temporary positions, often at several institutions if they uh, were able, had to make their rent, who could no longer, as a result, provide the uh, continuity and personal attention that so many of the academies uh, influx of new uh, first time on campus students uh, needed, seriously needed. At the same time, of course, um, colleges were becoming increasingly un unaffordable. Administrations raised tuitions to uh, try to make up for the cuts in state support. Uh, initially, these tuitions were rather low and uh, backed by uh, federal loans that seemed affordable. But with time, they both rose and came to create uh, that current debt crisis that blights so many students' futures today. And of course, continue to contribute to these students on these students contributing to these uh, institutions on popularity among a mass of Amer ordinary Americans. Meanwhile, on the campus, administrators were also adopting a hierarchical corporate style of governance uh, in accordance with the dominant neoliberalism of the period uh, to try to um, uh, grow their institutions, to, to try to uh, develop uh, corporate ways of accountability uh, and other um, methods of cutting costs, in particular. Uh, in the process, they increase the size of their uh, administrative staffs until now there are more administrators than teachers. Um, this may seem crazy, but those, when we think about all the people involved in non-teaching activities of universities, the lawyers, uh, the uh, counselors, the people who are uh, dealing with the Americans with Disability Act, uh, the people who are uh, will it, working on um, uh, diversity, equity, and education and inclusion projects. Uh, many of them mandated, but not funded by the federal government. Uh, this is uh, one reason for that. Um, these administrators increasingly stressed, of course, are also limiting uh, the pro their professors' participation in decision-making, which along with the austerity and threat of increasing cuts within the instructional budgets are seriously damaging faculty morale everywhere. Then along came COVID, destroying whatever ability members of the academic community would have had to work out collective solutions to their institution's problems because they could never even uh, get together on campus. They didn't know each other anymore and work on their uh, problems together. Um, even so, it is possible that the, the nation's universities could have regained their earlier order, aura. But there was a conspiracy, and I use that word reluctantly, but quite consciously, that was created by a cohort of uh, billionaire philanthropists and libertarian fundamentalists uh, de devoted to shrinking the public sector that as Nancy McLean has shown so brilliantly in her really important book, Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America, a book everybody should uh, 
purchase and read. Uh, Nancy uh, McLean has shown how effectively this uh, cohort of wealth has undermined American higher education. Um, even before a conservative attorney and future in Virginia and future Supreme Court justice named Lewis Powell uh, wrote uh, that right wing campaign's most iconic document. It was a 38 page memo that sketched out uh, the outlines of a program that he felt was necessary to combat an ex existential uh, threat to America's free enterprise system by um, uh, radical uh, students on elite campuses. Uh, that powerful cohort of right-wing philanthropists were already in action. And over the next half century, they threw hundreds of millions of dollars into the campaign against the academy that actually turned Powell's program for um, realigning American political culture into a very powerful and successful movement. It revolved around demonizing the university while creating a variety of counter institutions, a counter intelligentsia, one of these uh, right wing funders uh, called it, composed primarily of think tanks uh, like the American uh, Enterprise Institute and Heritage Society, of journals, academic centers on a variety of campuses. Um, endowed professorships, law firms, and student organizations, all of them working together to supplant mainstream academic knowledge and, and expertise with pro-business propaganda and discredited pseudoscience as a force, source of information and policy ideas for politicians and the uh, media as well. Uh, it delegitimized de uh, ordinary mainstream academic expertise um, and has had a powerful impact. Uh, we can see its impacts for its effects, for example, in the um, anti political correctness campaign that was directed against the universities during the late. Uh, 1980s and early 90s, where uh, a group of well-subsidized writers uh, like uh, Alan Bloom at the University of Chicago and Dinesh D'Souza um, purveyed uh, well-publicized scenarios of intolerance about intolerant campuses populated by raging feminists and doctrinaire Marxists and politically biased in disciplines uh, like uh, that they claimed uh, ethnic and gender studies uh, had become. There were uh, also in the 2010s uh, attempts by right-wing provocateurs who went on to campuses to give uh, their uh, highly uh, inflammatory speeches uh, in the hopes of creating incidents uh, around them uh, by counter demonstrators, mainly uh, students and others, um, that would kind of pump up an atmosphere uh, that could be seen as a violent attempt to shut down, shut them down, and thus um, prove that there was no free speech for conservatives on American campuses. That was clearly not the case, but um, it got a buzz, it got attention, and. Um, by the time Donald Trump 
joined that uh, it movement with his own attack on critical, what came to be known as critical race theory and uh, divisive concepts about race and class and gender during uh, the presidential campaign of 2020, the academic community found itself so hollowed out and deformed by the austerity and negative publicity that it had been experiencing that its members were really unable to fight back effectively against the uh, uh, massive uh, wave of um, educational gag rules that were pouring out of uh, state legislatures and uh, essentially uh, attacking the core meaning of higher education, uh, tenure, yes, but also the ability of professional academics to control the content of their teaching and research and protect it against outside intervention. Um, I'd like to end maybe on a somewhat more encouraging note, because things are beginning to change. The recent defeat of a repressive ballot initiative in Ohio is very encouraging. Still, there are dozens of measures now on the books, limiting what professors can teach, what books they can assign, and abolishing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts to provide support for students from previously marginalized communities. These measures are being litigated, but given the uh, contemporary political makeup of the current uh, Supreme Court, uh, we can't count on the constitution and the court to protect us. So what we need now is collective action at the grassroots on our own campuses. There have been some promising ventures. Jennifer, I assume, is going to tell you about her own work in encouraging faculty senates to pass resolutions that condemn these educational gag orders. And I feel strongly that if faculty members work together and stand up for the integrity of their own educational work and their own um, academic freedom. Faculties who after all have the largest stake in higher education of anybody on the campus can begin to turn back the current threat of higher education. It has happened in several cases already, but it will not be easy. But uh, organizing large groups of faculty members at a campus level to fight against these new culture, uh, culture wars is absolutely essential if we are to preserve our right to teach, to learn, and to think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen, for that uh, wonderful presentation very detailed and uh, I think right on the on target. Uh, I would uh, like to now invite Jennifer to, to give us her take on uh, what's been happening both uh, in terms of the broad span of uh, dynamics that you mentioned and also uh, some contemporary things. Jennifer? Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for having us. But Ellen and I and our friend Valerie Johnson at DePaul University have co-edited a book that's forthcoming from Beacon Press called The Right to Learn, Resisting the Right-Wing Attacks on Higher Education. So I thought a lot about uh, Ellen's book while she was talking because The Lost Promise is fascinating deep dive into a lot of what she just mentioned. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about, and then I'll, I'll move to the Senate resolutions and collective action in a second. But one of the things that I love most about The Lost Promise is how it's called The Lost Promise, which you know sounds pretty depressing. And it's about the rise of austerity. It's about the way in which the sort of 
right wing and libertarian campaign to sort of delegitimize universities in the eyes of the public with the anti-political correctness, you know, starting from the Powell memo. Um, but weirdly enough, that, or not weirdly, but the book, when you actually read it, is very inspiring. Because what Ellen has done, she interviewed like over 100, I don't know how many people who were involved in the 1960s, who were important uh, faculty leaders on their campuses, who started petitions, et cetera, describing how they understood the dynamics at the time. So you get this really fine grained sense of the emotional, psychological, political, cultural, social dynamics which is incredibly helpful when then thinking about today. You get a sense of how people metabolized their experiences on the campus, how they, what kind of actions they took. And the inspiring part is that they really did take action. Even if the, the long-term broader trends are exactly what Ellen sketches, when you look more closely like she does in The Lost Promise, you see how many people spoke up, petitions that were written, um, teach-ins that were, mo that were uh, uh, mobilized, so much uh, the, the protests, and it's really actually quite inspiring. And so there's a kind of paradox where even though the situation is depressing, it inspires us to do the collective action that we need to do today. Because and they I did last It does note that this was the period when jobs were growing on trees that people had the economic uh, security so that even people who were fired for political reasons could find other jobs. Which made a big difference, I'm sure. You're much more willing to speak up if you think that you're going to still have a career in academia after, regardless of what happens to you on your own campus. Yeah, I mean, that's a big, so let's sort of move between the context of the 60s and the context today. Ellen mentioned that she didn't even have to apply to grad school. She was recruited. I went and I started graduate school in the 1990s, right as we were beginning to come to terms. We should have been coming to terms with it since the 1970s. But, you know, since soon after the seeming promise starts to fade quite quickly, we should have been coming to terms with it. But we hadn't as a as a profession at least within literature programs with the erosion of tenure positions. When I entered grad school, my Swarthmore professors were like, you're going at a great time because there's going to be a whole bunch of jobs when you finish your PhD because there's going to be a wave of retirements. What they weren't thinking about, even though we had plenty of evidence for it by then, was the fact that people were retiring, but they weren't being replaced by tenure line positions. They were being replaced by adjuncts. So by the time I finished my PhD program, I was keenly aware of the austerity, the ways in which the neoliberal campaigns had gutted shared governance, which is you absolutely have to have tenure to have meaningful shared governance. Um, so I came into the profession at a very different time. One of the other distinctions between then and now that Ellen's talk made me think of is, um, and she's is keenly aware of this as anyone, but the it's really nice to be reminded of how the anti-political correctness campaign and those moments, um, because they're a direct analog, of course, or there's a continuity between them and the anti-woke campaigns now. One, one thing that's also interesting, I think that Ellen's uh, work provokes is the fact that during the McCarthy period, so this is just another distinction, um, the McCarthy period, the enemy within was directly tied to an enemy without, right? Directly tied to foreign affairs and the idea that you know, communism could take over. What's interesting about this moment is the enemy within is, is homegrown. Yeah, the American, when you look at the way that the new conservatives are writing about wokeness, they're saying, oh, America is exporting its wokeness to other countries. So now America, the faculty in America are the enemy. The enemy within is, is the primary enemy. And that's a really interesting difference that I think needs to be explored further. OK, but to talk about the collective action, I did want to um, mention then in The Lost Promise, um, the way that so, for example, the teachings about Vietnam that Ellen talks about in The Lost Promise, you know, people held these teachings that offered a coherent narrative that explained why the war was both unwinnable and wrong. This That was a quote from The Lost Promise. We could be offering teachings today about the 
uh, money that's fueled political interference in higher education. The reason why, if you want to have a functioning democracy that has any kind of legitimacy internationally and domestically, you have to have, uh, you can't have partisan interference with curriculum, et cetera. Um, so we could be doing those. So what, what you mine from her book are a number of strategies that we could be using today, which I think is wonderful. Give with the caveat, as Ellen points out, that people are more precarious now. There's more contingent faculty who don't feel like they have any protections. Due process is being eliminated uh, in so many places. Jobs are scarce. So it's a much harder uh, ask of faculty to come together, but we don't really have much of a choice, I'd say. Um, so Ellen mentioned, so I'll just finish my uh, response by saying that Ellen, uh, picking up on Ellen's suggestion that I mentioned the faculty senate resolution. So when the first wave of legislative bills came out, trying to, what PEN America, which has done a great job, great job documenting, all of these bills and sort of trying to uh, raise the alarm about them. Um, when the first bills came out, they were primarily aimed at critical race theory and race. Of course, they quickly morphed. They're extremely opportunist and strategic in their political rhetorical campaigns. They morphed to LGBTQ stuff. But in the beginning, it was critical race theory predominantly. Um, and so the African-American Policy Forum we initiate, I worked with them to initiate a Senate resolution campaign so that faculty senates, because what we have to try to do, and it's, it is very difficult because there's a certain amount of wonkiness to even the concept of the faculty senate and how to explain academic freedom versus free speech versus shared governance versus, you know, what, do, what in shared governance, what do faculty have prerogative over versus administrators? But nonetheless, faculty senates are the place for this battle in many respects, because it's where faculty speak in one voice specifically around what uh, their critical relationship to the university, their prerogative of a curriculum, their expertise to determine a competent curriculum. So we started, a res we created a template, uh, Valerie Johnson, who's a co-editor with the book with Ellen that we mentioned, The Right to Learn. She and I created a template to uh, for faculty senates to use and to adapt and to revise for their own purposes that would be a resolution saying we will defend our academic freedom to teach critical race theory and race and gender justice. And what was really love, and it passed it over 80 higher education institutions. We targeted public flagships to get the word out because we knew that if a, you know, if a UT Austin, a University of Georgia, Athens passes it, other schools in Georgia, other schools in Texas might pass it. And that indeed is exactly what happened. Um, and so um, with very limited resources, we uh, a quite a wave of resolutions were passed across the country. Um, and I want to stress that even though we had the template and we reached out to them, it's, there's so much work on the ground that had to happen for all these 80 resolutions to pass. So the camp, the committees, the faculty Senate standing committees on their campuses, had to you know discuss the resolution, had to change it to fit you know their bylaws or add their specific details. Had to shop it around committees. Had to bring it to a vote. Had to make sure that vote would pass. Um, and one of the beautiful things I sat in on a couple of those Senate meetings when the book, uh, not my institution, Portland State, passed it, but I also got got to sit in on a couple of through Zoom. This was the COVID period, so Senate meetings were being handled through Zoom. So I got to sit in um, on a couple of the other Senate meetings in which a resolution was passed. And the lovely thing about it was that in discussing academic freedom, shared governance, faculty who did not originally see themselves as necessarily having a dog in the fight of critical race theory quickly realized that this was a direct assault on our ability to decide, faculties to, as a body, this ability to decide what we want to teach, who we want to hire, how we want to evaluate them. And so you go after race, you could go after climate change. And so the biologists, the people who study, you know, uh, toxics, toxins in the air, et cetera. You can, there's so many ways in which you let them interfere here 
And it's, uh, I hate that phrase slippery slope because I think it's so often used to stall change and prevent change. Oh, is this, if you do that, it's a slippery slope. But in this case, it really is very obviously a slippery slope as we go from race to social to, um, to sexual and gender identity justice to climate change to choice and abortion. It, it, you, it, they don't need if they succeed in one area, they can easily begin to succeed in others. So we, no matter our disciplinary uh, investments and commitments, we all have uh, a dog in the fight. And people realize that in passing the resolutions. I guess I'm I'm getting more and more interested, Ellen, um, in the differences and similarities between the McCarthy period. So, you know, the lost promise looks, so she has these, you know, books on the McCarthy period that are sort of the, the uh, reference points for our profession. Um, the No Ivory Tower book, for example. Um, and then the lost promise moves into the sixties. But if we can go back to your McCarthyism work, the differences between then and now, the similarities and the differences between the, the then and now, I'm getting more and more interested in. Um, so you said that it's much worse today because then it was loyalty oaths and investigations. A hundred faculty were fired. Now they're reaching into the classrooms and our curricula. Um, can you say more about similarities and differences between that period? Uh, yeah. uh, faculties were terrified, by the way, but also this is the early Cold War and it's a period, you know, the Rosenbergs are executed, the spies of the century. It's a period when most people uh, bought into what has been called the Cold War consensus and bought into a very highly demonized stereotype of what communism required of its members. And so um, what we saw was quite a lot of collaboration at a fairly high level within the universities with McCarthyism. And having McCarthy in a way protected that collaboration from being seen as a reactionary move because it was separate. Uh, the way McCarthyism operated was that mainly through the imposition of economic sanctions, people lost their jobs. That was it. Uh, you know, there weren't, it was terrible political repression, uh, very effective in destroying the left, but not many people went to prison because of it. Only, you know, the Rosenbergs were killed. Um, you know, it's not like it is in places today in China or Hungary or Turkey. Um, but what that meant was that people uh, assumed McCarthyism was essentially the operations of somebody like Joe McCarthy, who bullied people who made highly inflated charges, and that the uh, sort of quieter uh, elimination of people who, you know, had a, a, a FBI file because they had once uh, given money to a, a group that supported the Spanish, the loyalist cause in the Spanish Civil War, uh, like somebody like Robert Oppenheimer, who may or may not have been a communist. We don't know. We really don't know. His biographers don't know. Um, but anyhow, uh, a lot of people had been communists, but uh, gave it up. It wasn't an effective organization. It was too red bait. They would have gotten in trouble. Uh, so, um, what we were seeing was a uh, system that supported the political repression and assumed that it was McCarthy and his wild charges and that the quieter dismissals of people who were fingered by the secretly by the FBI were somehow different. That wasn't McCarthyism. 
And this separation of sort of the identification stage of political repression, the congressional investigating committees, the FBI uh, files slipped on the desk of a college president, which happened quite a lot, uh, that that was the first stage. And the second stage was something else. That was just firing people because they were an embarrassment to their schools. And because many people who supported uh, felt that communism, remember the bomb had just been dropped. People were terrified. You know, you had uh, air raid drills where kids uh, ducked under their uh, school desks. Uh, there was a very heightened nervousness about Russia. There had been spies. Uh, we know now there had been more spies than we knew about. Uh, but um, because of that consensus, uh, there wasn't a strong uh, movement in opposition. People were afraid they could be targeted. And in some cases they were if they supported uh, the firing of somebody uh, who was fired. Uh, uh, Tenure didn't hold during the uh, McCarthy period. It may hold now if something were to happen, but it, uh, people could just be fired at many schools. Uh, so that's part of it, that there was more complicity in a way. Uh, but on the other hand, what's happening now is this invasion of education in the most um, basic sense of trying to determine what gets, as you pointed out, what gets taught, what kind of research is done, who gets hired, and that's being done uh, in accordance with a very reactionary uh, sense of uh, uh, political agenda. And I think that's the main difference. So there's a possibility of a pushback. Um, you know, the 60s were just this sort of aberration period where, um, yes, there was a push. There was political repression. People were being fired because of their politics all the time, especially younger radicals. But, hey, you know, their friend over at UMass Boston just got them a job. Fine. Who doesn't want to be in Boston? So um, this is what was happening. Uh, and you don't hear about a blacklisting in the uh, academic community in the 60s. Uh, and at this point, of course, the uh, gag rules are not being enforced very strongly, certainly not at the college level. I know that the American Historical Association has been asking historians, and certainly history was one of the main disciplines that was being attacked here, if not the main one. Uh, and um, I have the feeling they, they didn't get any answers. They were asking for examples of people who got in trouble. And it's not happening, which is a good sign. Certainly. Uh, and what we want to do, I think, is if we can't prevent the passage of these bills in these uh, so gerrymandered state legislatures, what we have to do is think about cutting off the connection between the laws and their enforcement on individual campuses and making presidents and trustees aware that if they try to enforce them, they will have a very angry and very united and already organized uh, group of faculty members and students and probably outsiders as well. I mean, look who was voting in Ohio to get rid of this, con this uh, dreadful ballot initiative. Uh, it, it was uh, sort of people concerned about civil liberties and civil rights. So there's, there's, we do have a constituency out there uh, that needs to be mobilized a lot more than it is, but it does exist. And there is a possibility 
uh, for pushback. And it has to be done by very vocal, very public, uh, very clever uh, arguments and um, a lot of organizing, which has to take place on campus. I mean, this is one of the problems now because of so much distance learning that the obstacles to organizing, uh, unlike say organizing against the uh, war in Vietnam in the 1960s was very easy to do. You had coffee with people and they came to see the light. If they're not on campus, how do you even know them? Especially because 75% of all of this uh, instruction is by contingent people who are really not on campus because they're teaching you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday across town, and Tuesday and Thursday back in another city. Uh, so the obstacles are enormous, but there is potential because people aren't swayed by this. You know, you're not getting people colluding with, oh my gosh, I know that these gag rules are terrible, but, you know, we've, no, they can't. There's no but here. These gag rules are terrible. They're aimed at the heart of the university. And that wasn't the case during McCarthyism. So we have some things going for us, some things not. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, once a historian, always a historian. Uh, I uh, thank you for bringing up, you know, that faculty have stood up across time. I recall that Charles Beard, uh, stood up when his fellow faculty members were fired at Columbia, a place where you yourself taught. And later on, per, the faculty like Helen Lind were engaged in investigating uh, firings of faculty as well. Uh, and, you know, there's there's kind of a continuity to what's been happening. So neoliberalism didn't just come upon us in the 70s or 80s. You know, the, uh, the Austrian uh, conservative economists we we're talking about it and writing about it way back in the uh, 30s and 40s and so on. Uh, and it was uh, really Goldwater who brought it to us here and and peddled it during the, the, the 50s and 60s. Fortunately, he was not elected, but uh, uh, that uh, actor that you mentioned, Reagan, uh, you know, he was at one time uh, head of SAG and was uh, uh, and was supporting uh, strikes and so on. And then he uh, kind of just went 180 degrees, went in the other direction. But now, you know, we've been in this kind of in the middle in, in the midst of this movement now for what I would call three generations of, of people. And, uh, you know, when I am invited to give guest lectures, uh, I speak a lot about neoliberalism and students often come up afterwards uh, and say, you know, I didn't realize I was a neoliberal that I held neoliberal ideas, that they are they hold anti-government perspectives, that they're against regulation and so on. Uh, and so, you know, this is a heavy lift. You're talking about res uh, resistance, but, you know, this is a heavy lift because now these ideas are now have been inculcated and, and embodied in our institutions and in the minds of our young people. Can you speak to some of that? Sure. Um, I'm no longer teaching, so I'm not confronting uh, you know, this sort of extreme libertarianism that's so pervasive. Uh, but yeah, the hardest thing in teaching, especially in my case, teaching American history, is uh, getting through to uh, middle class students about how little America has lived up to its promise of egalitarianism and how deleterious uh, that inequality has been in almost every uh, arena of American society. And, you know, one of the things talking about the differences between McCarthyism and, and today, uh, one of the things that I see is the conflation of leftism and li liberalism you know, the, the the conservatives have done such a great job. There's no center anymore. It's just, you know, conservatives and leftists. Uh, can you speak to some of that? Uh, sure. Um, well, the whole political spectrum has moved to the right. We've seen that 
uh, especially, you know, with these narratives about uh, radicals having taken over the academic community. Well, yes, they are further to the left than most Americans. That has been documented, but it's not very far left. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we're, put it this way, we're now defending the New Deal of the 1930s. We've already lost much of the uh, great society, except, thank God, for my Medicare. Um, but, you know, the New Deal, I'm sure my Medicare is under attack all the time. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing is a uh, inability to exercise a political imagination about how things could have been different, how things had been different, what were the paths not taken. You know, that's what I do as a historian, is sort of go back, contextualize a certain decisions and say, well, if only, if there had been a stronger movement, if McCarthyism had not sort of terrified uh, the liberals and kept them from, even though they knew it was bad, had given them a little more backbone, it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have caused that chill. That caused an entire generation uh, to lose a lot of truth that was out there in society. I know in my uh, college education in the 1950s, uh, whole things just disappeared. And, you know, they were like Black history. It was alive and well in Black colleges, but it never reached uh, the mainstream white ones. So, um, you know, there's so much ignorance. And that's what we have to fight. And it's made even more complicated by the rise of social media and, and what I would call the epistemic crisis, where people can't tell the difference between fact and fiction. I mean, they think that if they find something on the internet, that it's true, or it just resonates with their thinking. And so that's what they're going to follow. But there's no real, uh, particularly with conservatives, you know, just obscuring reality and their kind of extremist views, people can't make sense of what's happening. Yeah, especially if these myths about the world are being perpetrated by very well-paid, very articulate uh, people who are um, doing this maybe out of, uh, you know, genuine conviction or maybe because there's seems to be more money on the right than on the left. I don't know why that could happen. Uh, but anyhow, uh, what we're seeing is just uh, so much illegitimate uh, lying going on. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I was just going to add, yeah, it, it strikes me that, you know, one of the ways that the campaign against higher education and academic freedom is being waged is not just through censorship and gag orders, but also through using the fact that we've been so uh, forced into a position of austerity and become so starved that we are willing, or our administrators at least, are very easily manipulated into create using a new infusion of money to create centers for a free market kinds of ideologies and different kinds of ideologies. If there's money, even if it's got strings attached, it's going to get taken. And that's so dangerous. And so the carrots, we need to be uh, you know, vigilant about the carrots as well as the sticks. And it's, it strikes me that the some of the, you know, the argument is that we need, you know, our students don't understand our own country, right? That's the, that's the line. So we need civics education and, and uh, American history with founding fathers kind of stuff. What we really need is, um, I'm thinking about what you said, Ruben, about 
social media and how that's changed the dynamic so that our students, it's or in the public in general gets confused between fact and fiction. We don't necessarily, we don't need a, a you know a Madison Institute. We need to, to courses on critical media literacy and how you determine you know, what's legitimate knowledge or what that's been vetted by people who actually are trained in the field versus what's propaganda essentially. So. Well, another piece of this, of course, is that um, whole fields of knowledge are shrinking, especially in the humanities and some of the uh, softer social sciences. And there is this enormous focus on STEM, getting people into STEM fields because you can get a job. Well, it's true. Uh, but there are other things that education does that um, also matter, and that it's very hard. And this, this is really, I think, a dereliction of duty in the highest level by the leaders of the academic community who have focused on civility on campus and, uh, you know, protecting both their the kings and queens of both sides is and that kind of stuff, and not making a case for liberal arts education so that you end up with this uh, lovely school in uh, Sarasota, Florida, the new college that has, it, it's like a case study in the future horrors uh, we may be facing. Uh, it was an experimental um, university where students had enormous amounts of freedom to create their own educations. And it create, it attracted apparently wonderful quirky kids who, and some, you know, dodos as well, I know, I'm sure. But um, it was lively. It was intellectually lively. And so um, DeSantis uh, decided to replace it. And he was going to make it be a school that would give, bring back the traditional classical education. So, but then it turns out that instead of hiring uh, Latin teachers and philosophy professors, you know what they're hiring, you know what fields they're going into. Coaches. <laughs> or, uh, you know, what else is it? There's some more, um, you know, like business uh, kind of stuff, not liberal arts, business, liberal. finance. And sports, sports medicine, but also uh, recruiting athletes. Recruiting athletes, giving them big fellowships. You know, it used to be kids got fellowships because they were smart or had some gift that uh, the school appreciated. Now it's just, um, you know, football players or ba baseball players seems to be what it is. Uh, probably there's somebody on the board of trustees who's a real big uh, baseball fan. Um, so, you know, what are we seeing? Uh, they're being turned into trade schools. They're not being asked to think about uh, issues that are really relevant to the world they're living in. Um, you know, I imagine general education programs are shrinking, which is the only place where people uh, can get a sort of basic humanities education that asks them to think and then apply what they've read, the ideas they've read to something else. Just making a connection between one thing and another doesn't seem to be what you do uh, if you're uh, working in sports psychology. Uh, so, you know, we're losing an ability to, you know, I hate to use the word think critically because it's a cliche and it's badly defined, but we are losing that. And um, it's scary to think about all these people who are making it in the world uh, without ever having thought on their own. Thomas Frank, one of the uh, 
you know, prominent writers in the nation has a book titled uh, uh, What's the Matter with Kansans? And he writes about how uh, the conservative movement there uh, attacks, you know, the the liberal elites and so on, and show up uh, screaming, we're here to cut your taxes, <laughs> which I find hilarious because they're actually supporting neoliberalism. Uh, but that bring, brings me to something that you mentioned, that's economic dislocation. All of this political correctness, cultural wars, anti-wokeness, whatever you want to call it, has dislocated serious conversations about the economy and the and the changes in our economy uh, over the last you know 50 years that were wrought by neoliberal uh, advocates and and so on uh how do we get back to talking about reality and less about uh you know some of this uh crazy stuff that and the crazy propaganda that the that the really extreme right has uh wrought upon us I guess by talking about reality, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's true. It's one thing that's important to realize is that, you know, even if we weren't facing, um, you know, educational gag rules and this whole crazy anti-CRT, anti-woke, anti-gay stuff, uh, there still are serious problems within American society that have been shoved under the rug, um, I guess, since 1619, shall we say, uh, especially racial ones, um, and that uh, people are suffering uh, homelessness. People are suffering hunger. This didn't used to be be the case. This doesn't have to be the case. And I think that's what we have to be talking about. And um, somehow, how do we change the subject? Uh, I wonder if, given the fact that targeting higher education, universities, faculty, I wrote something that was critical of Chris Rufo and the Chronicle the other day, and Chris Rufo tweeted, oh, the academic mandarins are upset. This idea of mandarins, elites, maybe we need to make really clear what the typical instructor looks like, how they live, what their standard of living is, what their, their precarity is. So if we redirect to, oh, here are these the elite that, you, that you're hearing so much about to contingency, adjunctification, precarity, uh, then we find connections between the suffering in the academy, the employees and the, the labor in the academy and the labor more generally in society. And so that might be a way to redirect to the economy and find solidarity between academic workers and workers, Amazon workers, healthcare workers, et cetera. I really think through unions, through uh, multiracial progressive unions that are trying to make the case to workers elsewhere through and creating uh, solidarity with them and uh, uh, building our numbers, that that that's one way that's one possible path especially in now which is a moment of such amazing union activity we just haven't seen anything like that uh really what decades decades you know the union movement has been as hollowed out again by the same right wing forces of course i mean lewis pal never liked unions uh, so encouraging unions as a institutional home for uh, bringing these issues to the American public is very important. And that part is, is getting attention and is getting sympathy. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, people are now living so on the edge that even if you know that your job at Starbucks sucks, um, you don't have the economic security to say, okay, I'm going to risk it and go on strike for a long time. That, that's not possible. So what do we have to do? We have to organize even more people 
in solidarity and more people and more. I mean, we've we do have strength in numbers, but it's hard to mobilize and we just have to do it. And everybody is so overwhelmed by the uh, what people in the medical field called activities of daily life that which is true. It's a lot harder. You know, I think back about why did I have more time when I was younger? And I realized it was because I didn't have a computer. Right. You know. Many, many people, as you say, are engaged in what uh, uh, Marx called forced labor. There we use a Marxian concept. Oh, my gosh, Mandarin's coming out of the weeds again, right? Um, but one of the things that I like to, to, to mention is that uh, neoliberalism was imposed on us through uh, by stealth mode, right? A lot of us did not understand what was happening. I remember hearing about it in, in 1984 when my chair was complaining that... Uh, uh, some local politicians were referring to students as customers, right, as, a, as opposed to co-creators of knowledge. Uh, and I see that our young faculty today, they have no understanding of what the academy was like, what it really stood for, and so on. Uh, but I don't see the senior faculty, let me say, uh, standing up either. Uh, they Apparently, the the, the system has kept their noses to the grindstone so closely that they can't see the forest for the trees. And so- Can I I'm speak to, to that, Ruben? Yes, absolutely. Because the generational sort of culture and disposition among faculty is a really interesting to me. When I joined, so I was only 29 when I joined Portland State English Department faculty. There were a number of senior faculty at the time who had been very involved in faculty senate, very involved in the union. We have a very strong union on our campus and they could model for me, but they were they were literally within five to seven years of retiring. But I got to see them and I got to see their way that they they felt entitled in a good way to help lead the university, to make decisions, to make policy. Um, and that was a wonderful model. And I think um, it's true that my generation, who are now the senior faculty, either we needed to be able to see it right before people retired. Or, but one of the, the reasons why some of us aren't speaking up as much as we should or getting involved on our campuses as much as we should is because the expectations around achieving tenure escalated so highly. So well, at the same, so even if you joined a university before senior faculty who could model that kind of uh, ownership of the university had retired, you were trying to get two books for tenure. So you had your head down trying to get tenure. And I think that kind of academic stardom and academic fear around extremely escalated productivity standards really kind of hurt my generation and picking up the mantle from the previous generation. Well, also it's um, the shrinking of faculty governance meant that uh, tenured professors and tenure track professors are being deluged with more administration and more busy work than ever before because there are fewer of them in proportion. And they have to, uh, you know, just assessing um, your colleagues is a chore. And since there are fewer senior people on campuses to handle this, um, they're getting stressed out too. That's exactly right. It's not necessarily just sort of the selfishness of I want to build my own career of careerism. It's also the expansion of administrative tax tasks because there are fewer and fewer of us that have service as part of our portfolio. I think sometimes also faculty don't often see the importance of working with administrators and tend to see them as, uh, I hate to use the word, as enemies, you know, as the others who are against us. But that's not always the case. Uh, there are many, uh, you know, presidents who have reluctantly imp uh, implemented some neoliberal policies, but only because politicians were ready to cut funding to the university or something. And there have been others who were active uh, neoliberal leaders and so on. But, you know, I was a, a leader of, of, of faculty, uh, both at the campus level and system-wide level. And I recall walking across campus one time and one of the, uh, uh, I guess, the leader of, of the faculty at that time uh, approached me and says, you know, we're meeting, uh, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, but we didn't invite you because you're an administrator, <laughs> which I thought, boy, I would want to, if there had been a, an administrator who had been a leader of the faculty, uh, when I was leader of the faculty, I would have wanted to talk to that person because they would uh, have similar values uh, and would be uh, academic administrators, right? Unlike some of these uh, politicians and retired military men who have been appointed as presidents and so on, uh, as ways of transforming the university. So, you know, sometimes the faculty don't really get it in terms of how to bring about some change. And I'm sure, uh, Jennifer, that you saw some of that with your uh, uh, effort to to pass a resolution, right? Um, you, I wasn't thinking about the resolution so much. And actually, no, because I was talking to people who are already involved in their faculty senates. And so if the only sort of resistance, actually, it was it was shocking how many people responded to our outreach um, and, and in, warmly. The only resistance I got there were from people who actually had sort of internalized the neoliberal and the reactionary kind of thinking who didn't want to defend critical race theory. And that was only one or two people um, in at schools where in red states where the the polarization is so extreme. But what you made me think of is the fact that I was the chair of my department at Portland State and I ran for chair explicitly not just because well no one will do it and that kind of the way that it usually works but explicitly to fight neoliberalism by reversing the trend of uh, precarious jobs, because we were one of the worst offenders in the university in terms of our tenure line versus contingent ratios. So I made it super clear that I'm running to be chair, not um, to keep everybody happy, maintain the status quo, keep administrators happy, but to fight administrators to give us the good jobs instead of squeezing us to more and more exploit people. Um, and what was kind of startling, this speaks, Ruben, to your sort of sense of irritation or disillusionment with some faculty who are so quick to see administrators as enemies, is I couldn't have been more explicit about my position and why I was being chair, which was to fight administrators. And yet you step into that role and so quickly you hear, oh, somebody, Jennifer went to the dark side. Oh, it's just... It's it is a very pervasive kind of attitude that I think we you know it hurts us because it's easy to have to do it but if faculty are being brought out of the ranks into administrative positions you got to work with them from their faculty um, you know identifications. Absolutely, they're academic administrators, not just administrators, and I think we we need to to emphasize that. But we are getting close to the end of our time here, uh, and I just want to mention that you know tenure faculty are still the 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 large uh, number of faculty on campuses. We're, Frank and I are retired from Michigan State University, and I've taken a look at those numbers, and you know proportionately, we're overwhelmingly tenure track faculty. So there's a lot of universities like that. I know that friends of mine in California refer to the contingent faculty as freeway flyers, because mm -hmm. as you and, and uh, Ellen mentioned, they're running from one from one institution to another to teach courses and so on. Um, and hopefully what we can do if we engage in the collective work that you are, and, and Ellen are talking about, uh, we can put an end to the numbers of freeway flyers in, in our country. Uh, but we've, we're coming to the end here, and I would invite you to make some closing comments, and then we will turn to Ellen to make some closing comments as well. Oh, uh, I just appreciate being here and getting to say everything that I have said, and I'm happy to turn it over to Ellen for the final comments. Well, I think that uh, I guess I'm a little optimistic these days. Uh, what both uh, Jennifer and I have been working with besides this book that uh, contains, by the way, I'll give a plug for the book. We've got some amazing things. We have a uh, testimony from one of the faculty members who was prevented from speaking out against a voting, a restrict of, of law to restrict voting in the uh Florida legislature by the university, there was a massive uprising uh, within her department, within the university, and the national university, they reached out to everybody. Um, and the president backed down. 
and she's talking and now she is the lead one of the lead plaintiffs in a major case that will probably go to the supreme court the against the anti woke law so um that's something you know kind of inspirational jennifer has a wonderful piece about the academic senate resolutions a um young woman who may who's you know was so in such a precarious position that she took a full-time job outside of the university but nonetheless wrote a brilliant piece uh after interviewing some of the leaders in this faculty senate resolution campaign uh, that really shows you the kind of nitty-gritty work that has to be done and the attitudes that faculty that need to understand if this is going to be effective uh we have a piece by um a guy who uh I Isaac Amola who has been investigating along with Nancy McLean uh this dark money going into the uh anti uh higher education campaign of the neoliberals uh we have a piece by people from Penn which has done a magnificent job uh we and uh, the forward is uh done by the president of the AAUP which um i think both Jennifer and i feel uh could have done more certainly in the past did not do enough to battle political repression but which we are hoping is going to be more energized than it has been recently. Uh so there is some hope. Um and people understand. I mean that's the other thing. It's not that hard a sell unless of course you have a closed mind and how can you pry open the closed minds of the maga people who have legitimate grievances but they're not against the university, you know. their legitimate grievances are against the people who destroyed the blue collar uh economy in the United States uh and you go out into the countryside uh and you see the trump signs everywhere and these are people who you know for example they're they're very fond of their guns and they need their guns and they're scared people like me are going to take their guns away from them uh but you know half of their um uh nutrition during the winter uh comes from the deer they killed you know we're talking survival here so um you know somehow we have to reach across to them uh i would suggest maybe thinking of some way to get climate change more central to the world to these conversations uh after all there is a party that's still denying it but you know Maui just burned it's not an accident so i think you know Jennifer you're right maybe we do have to change our uh discourse and stop talking quite as much about uh academic freedom in a kind of narrow procedural way and think about the fact that um the people who are opposing real science are uh going to destroy the earth and I would have one other thing of hope which is the students and so one so if we if we redirect attention to the environment to the ways in which the typical professor is not some um cushioned elite but actually has the same kind of economic precarity as so many workers in our economy if we redirect that stuff we also though don't give up in any way on that we are a multiracial democracy that needs to tell an honest history that we want people to express their gender and sexual identities however they want we want to respect those pronouns and one of the reasons we don't give up on that because it's the right thing to not give up on it but also because we will find solidarity with this generation of students by doing that because they they're not being consulted this, this is not the stuff that's happening is not um 
there are a number of conservative students who are getting paid to do internships or to write things about their professors, but they're getting paid. The majority of this generation, as far as I can tell, certainly from my experience in teaching, but as far as I can tell from what I read, they are they are on board with a new history of America, with LGBTQ rights, and they're not going to take this sitting down. So we need to make common cause with them. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to thank the two of you for joining us today on Future You. Uh, and I will close by saying to our propagandists out there that there is not a communist in every classroom in our universities. Thank you very much, the two of you, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you.